Overdose deaths and drug abuse are at an all-time high. Drug wars are ravaging our communities, rural, suburban, and urban. Costs to healthcare, education, families, businesses, and taxpayers continue unabated. Narco-terrorism is destroying our neighboring countries. The economies support overseas enemies while corrupting people and institutions domestically. Uh, how did we get here? And what can be done about this? That's what Dr. Dan Morheim asks and will work to address and answer here in his presentation, The War on Drugs and Epic Policy Failure. Uh, hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan, I'm the Vice President at the JES and I'm a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. Before we get to his presentation, a bit about the presenter. Dr. Morheim brings a unique perspective to this compelling topic as a frontline emergency uh, medicine physician for 40 plus years. A Maryland State Legislature for 24 years, faculty member at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health for 16 years, and author of two books, including The Better End, with details at thebetterend.com. As an emergency medicine physician, Dr. Morheim has been on the front lines of healthcare for over 40 years, including 13 as the chair of emergency medicine at Franklin Square Hospital in Baltimore, while building a six hospital ER group practice. Uh, after his election to the Maryland General Assembly in 1994, he joined the ER team at the um, at, at the Sinai Hospital in Baltimore, where he continues on the staff. Uh, he serves in the Maryland legislature, served in the Maryland legislature from 1995 through 2019, enacting 139 bills on broad range of topics with a focus on healthcare, environment, and procurement reform. Uh, he has been and continues to be on uh, numerous boards and public health committees, including serving currently as the chair of the Baltimore County Behavioral Health Advisory Council. He brings a clinical perspective to Eagle Force, a health IT company, and he is the medical director for two commercial ambulance companies and has written many articles for both medical publications and the general media. His research uh, while faculty at Hopkins School of Public Health on advanced care planning led to two books, the first uh, in 2011 uh, and his second, Preparing for a Better End, uh, in 2020, both from Johns Hopkins Press. The books have earned endorsements from a diverse group of distinguished people, including Maya Angelou, U.S. Senator Ben Cardin, uh, Dr. Lena Wen, and other uh, others from the medical, academic, faith, and business communities. For a fuller bio, please do head over to our website, jeserie.org. Now, folks, since this program is first airing live on the JES Facebook page and as a Zoom webinar, we're going to work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you're watching on Facebook and have a question, just leave it in the comment section below. If you're watching via Zoom webinar, please use the Q&A function. Uh, we're going to get to as many of those questions after Dr. Morheim's presentation as we can. And of course, if you're listening to or watching a later broadcast of this program, streaming it on demand, still send us your questions, your comments to keep this conversation conversation going. And of course, for more information about upcoming JES programs and publications, do visit our website, jeserie.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Dan Morheim to the JES Digital Stage. Dr. Morheim, thank you for joining us here. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Olivia Wickline, also at JES. And thank you to my friend Brad Paganoff from Erie, who made the connection. And thank you for all listening. This is a topic that permeates our culture in ways that you may not have considered. Now, let's be clear, no one is for substance abuse, but what we've been doing clearly isn't working. Overdose deaths, um, drug dealing, all violence, crime, all is at, at an all-time high. And I want to go into um, how we got here, but for all those efforts, the millions of dollars, thousands, tens of thousands of people, millions of people impacted were actually worse off. And so, uh, I'm going to switch now to uh, the slide presentation, so bear with me while I flip to share screen. And there we go. So um, that's my contact information, and there's the book information, uh, which is on end of life care, another topic I'm passionate about. But this is one I confronted uh, as an ER doctor. That's what motivated me, and it just came from uh, talking to my patients and their families, just the sheer number of people involved uh, was, uh, was just amazing. So uh, I, I began to ask my patients, uh, you know, what's going on? And so I'm, as a legislator, I was interested in our economy and public safety, but I saw so many uh, innocent victims of crime. I worked with police and law enforcement, um, but I mainly cared about the patients. And, and, and it's just from really talking to them. And in an ER setting, I would just 
might be doing something like sewing a laceration or listening to their lungs and, uh, and then asking them about their lives and how they got in the predicament uh, that, they, that they are in. So um, this is all really based on policies. I know we sometimes think drug use is failings of individuals and genetics and morals and things like that. And certainly there are those elements, but I wanna share with you that there are really, these are all about various uh, policies uh, that have taken place, conscious decisions people made and policies can be made and policies can be changed. Uh, let's acknowledge that um, we do like to change our moods. Uh, there are healthy ways uh, to do that. Um, there are certainly risks uh, in some cases. In case of cannabis, there are certainly risks, but uh, no one's ever died of it. Um, other cultures are pretty good at setting up the, the boundaries, the parameters of substance use. For example, Indians and tobacco. Um, and then of course, uh, uh, and this was uh, marijuana back in the day of the Egyptians. It's been around for thousands of years. And um, wine has been very popular in uh, religious rites and as a sacrament, but it also has its risk when people turn to alcoholism. I wanna go through uh, a variety of source materials with you. So, you know, this is just not a personal rant. And um, let's start with first a good look at the political history, the recent political history uh, that uh, brought us here. And we'll start with these two people. Some of you will recognize on the right, President Richard Nixon. And to his left is John Ehrlichman. John Ehrlichman was his do chief domestic policy advisor. He went to jail for his involvement in the Watergate affair. And when, after he was out, he gave interviews and he explained a little bit about the version of the war on drugs that started in 1970. And here's an upcoming direct quote. Now, as I go through some of these things, I will read some of the slides, but I'm gonna try real hard not to read most of them, just the highlight parts. So you read the slides as we go. And so in a later interview, he expressed the following view and he made it very clear that it was a political decision by getting, and it's in the bold, by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana, blacks with heroin, and criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities, arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So they knew what they were doing, and this was a, a calculated a political policy. Certainly there was drug use going on, but not to the degree or the extent with all the consequences that we're seeing today. This followed up uh, with uh, President Reagan who continued the war on drugs. You all remember the just say no phrase. And how we spend our money indicates what our value is. Sometimes we say, oh, these are our things are really important to us. Education is important and studying drug abuse is important. But actually uh, during those years, the um, expenditures are, are what you see. And so a, a lot of money went into law enforcement and what went into uh, public health and education uh, went substantially in the other direction. Um, not to uh, say that it was just the Republicans involved. Uh, when uh, Bill Clinton was campaigning, he wanted to be sure to let people know that he was a tough on crime and uh, he did campaign on that. And here's some of the things that happened during his time. And the two most significant ones, and I'll get back to them again later, were that one strike and you're out. Any drug conviction excluded those with a criminal history from public housing. But what that also meant is that if a family lived in public housing and one member of that family got arrested for a drug conviction, they could not move back into that house. Otherwise, the entire family would be forced to vacate. So it was really a serious implication that impacted housing. And when you see the pictures of the homeless today, part of that is clearly related to this policy decision. And then uh, when uh, you see further down in 1998, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act um, again created a, it created a death penalty and a mandatory minimum five-year sentence for the simple possession of cocaine. Again, this was something that uh, then led to uh, a lot of people going to jail for extended periods of time. And that led to all kinds of other problems. There was a distinction made uh, between cocaine powder and crack cocaine was known as a hundred to one policy. And I ask you to read the 
uh, text on the right of the slide. But basically, it's the same drug. Crack cocaine was more popular, so to speak, in the black community, and powder cocaine was in the uh, white community. And um, you know, think uh, of, uh, of very successful people snorting lines of coke during those years. But the fact of the matter is that when black people got, or anybody got it uh, impacted, arrested with crack, uh, they got much more uh, jail time. And it was just a completely unfair, and in effect, a targeted uh, policy. So these policies work for political gain. Uh, they certainly helped uh, in that category, and they set up whole industries in the prison and police system, but they did nothing to achieve their stated goals. The stated goals being less substance abuse and less harm from the secondary impacts of substance abuse. And if they worked, well, we wouldn't be in the position we are in now. I wouldn't be giving this talk. You wouldn't be listening. We'd be talking about something else. So um, the, the situation led to the following, and this is pretty current facts. Um, a lot of people are in federal prison. This does not count the state prisons. A lot of drug crimes are at the state level, but those in federal prison, uh, many of them are serving life sentences without parole for drug offenses. And I'm not, I don't want to excuse drug dealing. Don't get me wrong here. Um, and most, most of those people are people of color. So this was a policy, again, that targeted, as it did, as uh, Ehrlichman clearly stated in 1970, targeting hippies and blacks, and it worked. And of course, when that happens, other things uh, uh, accrue. The, it, getting arrested for a, a drug crime is the ungift that keeps on giving. And Michelle Alexander in her excellent book, and I'll give you some references at the end, um, pointed out the, the stigma that happened and the other problems. And I, I learned this really from my patients because I would be talking to someone saying, well, you know, you, 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 we're here for, you're here because you have an abscess from a shooting up with a dirty needle or you've got uh, some other kind of injury or illness. Uh, it's clear you're using drugs or you're telling me that you are. How did, how did this get started and what's going on in your life now? And so many of them told me that uh, it's, what happened was they had a, a early uh, an arrest doing something silly or stupid when they were dangerous, even when they were young, and then ended up in jail and then couldn't vote, uh, couldn't get employment, couldn't get housing, couldn't wel do welfare, and even got saddled with debt because they had to pay for things like ankle bracelets when they did get released. So basically a whole bunch of doors closed with that first arrest, especially now in the internet age where everything about uh, all of us is known. Uh, all these doors that uh, to legitimate life closed and the ones that opened were uh, to get to push you into a life of, of crime. So once trapped, there was really no way out. And I talked to thousands of patients who told me these stories. And, uh, you know, they made some poor decisions, but other people were getting away with it because often these were poor folks or, or minorities who didn't have access to high-end lawyers and got out of it. But let's, let's shift a bit here now. This was the political decision. And look at, uh, talk to, look, get, get some perspective from another expert, and we'll look at the money side of this because there's a huge amount of money involved in all of this. And, and there he is, El Chapo. Everybody knows uh, Joaquin Guzman, El Chapo, who was a major drug dealer. And uh, he was interviewed and he was asked in effect, uh, why do you sell drugs? And he basically said, well, if you weren't and there's no consumption, there would be no sales. And when I was poor in the mountains of Sinaloa, the only way to get money was to um, uh, deal with drugs. Now, you know, this is where we, we always want to blame him and people like him, and obviously they have their role. But frankly, if we weren't consuming drugs at the astonishing rate that we are uh, as a society, American society, they wouldn't be selling it. But that's on us. But we don't want to confront that part of the reality that we're in. And let's also notice the industrial uh, scale here. Uh, it's not wannabe immigrants that are carrying over stuff in a, in a backpack or two. It's um, a huge enterprise uh, that's taking place. And, uh, uh, and it was submarines, airplanes, trucks, and boats. And even the uh, Justice Department pointed out that this was a huge enterprise. And, and for those of you that have read about prohibition, this is a lot like prohibition where alcohol was 
Um, yeah, someone could carry a bottle of gin in, but that wasn't big enough to satisfy the, the uh, demand. So um, much more elaborate industrial scale, right, really rivaling any major business um, would, uh, uh, would get the, the, the alcohol in, and in this case, get the various uh, drugs in. So this is uh, what's going on, and it, it gets worse because a lot of that, those drugs come from uh, uh, far Asia, Afghanistan, and, and uh, the local uh, groups, ISIS, Taliban, uh, Al-Qaeda, they target centers for opiate productions. And so they grow the opium, uh, get it shipped here, and then uh, they end up reaping the financial rewards. So we've been continuing on a policy trajectory that has been destroying our country from the inside while shipping large sums of money to those who would destroy us from the outside. So um, it's, think of this as a global drug trafficking industrial complex. It may, it may even be the largest business on earth. When you think about it from a global perspective, um, and think of it compared to any commercial product. Product is grown or chemically made in China, where's where most of the fentanyl comes from, uh, overseas, and then shipped virtually to every street corner, in effect, in the United States and, and the rest of the world. And then all that money gets siphoned back up to the, uh, through various schemes, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, to, to the uh, growers and the distributors. So it's really an enormous uh, economy. We see pictures like this all the time, the drug bucks. We've seen many, there's the guns, there's the drugs, there's the money. And we think, well, that, that's great, uh, that'll stop it. But how many years have we seen pictures like this? And as soon as, as, soon as one uh, set of dealers uh, get arrested or the drugs get busted, um, there's no, uh, no, no break in the enterprise, it, someone else fills, fills their shoes. So it's a, it's a profit motive at all uh, levels that's taking place. And um, the banks are involved too. There's huge money laundering schemes. In fact, uh, when drug dealers in some uh, uh, places uh, south of the border, when they're shoving the cash through into the banks, they have uh, they put the cash in metal containers that are exactly designed to fit through the teller window, the slot of the teller window, so they get the maximum amount of money shoved through. That's down to that level of detail. But here's some of our more well-known banks. And when they get fined, um, it's just uh, basically it's been, and it sounds like a lot of money to get banked, gets uh, fined $100 million. Well, that's, that's a slap on the risk. That's the cost of doing business from their point of view. Now, this is from Forbes. September 2020. That's, Forbes is a major legitimate magazine uh, and certainly not any left-leaning kind of uh, orientation. So there's drug trafficking uh, and financial involvement of all the major institutions to, that, that really work uh, to make this, this all happen. Let's drill down to a community. I use my community, but you can plug in the numbers here for your own community. And when I take care of patients in the ER, and I knew there were substance abusers, I also was a volunteer physician at a homeless clinic for three years, one day a week. And so I talked to a lot of folks there as well. Uh, many were more of a hardcore uh, daily user types. And I would ask them three questions. How did you start using? How much did it cost? And uh, would you go into treatment? And many of them uh, started using just because somebody else persuaded them. It's in fact, it's kind of the pyramid scheme of addiction. If I'm a substance abuser, my goal, uh, one of the ways that I can make the money to maintain my own habit is to um, get my friends and immediate circle of people to uh, buy from me. And I make the marginal difference that sustains my, my own financial needs. And it's 365 uh, days a year. Think about uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, the thing about Katrina and uh, other disruptions in communities uh, in Baltimore was the Freddie Gray uh, uprisings. Uh, when the lines of drug distribution uh, got disrupted, uh, people went and uh, found drugs in other ways, typically by raiding pharmacies. So, how did they get started? Um, that's how they got started. And then they started with petty crimes. Most people did not start doing major crimes, but petty crimes, dealing, 
and then they became more involved in more major crimes. I asked them how much it cost every day, $10, $10 to $200 a day, 365 days a year for the hardcore users, 365 days a year. And uh, I asked them, uh, would you go into treatment? And almost all of them said that they would. But one of the things about emergency medicine that, that troubled me, and I tried to do some legislation, made a little progress on this. Now think of me as in my role as an ER doctor, not a legislator. If you came in with a heart attack or some other condition that I needed a cardiologist, I, I could get one in there even at two in the morning. And if you had an orthopedic injury that I couldn't manage, I could get an orthopedist in there. But um, what about uh, substance abuse or mental health, of which, of course, these two overlap a, a great deal. Um, basically, all I could do is give you a sheet of paper with a bunch of referral numbers and hope that you would call. It's real. We don't treat it the same as we treat other medical diseases. And we know that people will relapse in treatment, but so do people with diabetes, so do people with asthma, so do people with congestive heart failure, so do people with emphysema. So um, that's that's uh, it. But I do remember what my dog is barking, excuse me, one patient I, I asked about how, how his, uh, his drug care, care went. And he said, well, doc, um, uh, I'm allergic to drugs. I break out in handcuffs. So um, there's always that criminal element. But let's do a calculation here based on these numbers. Um, this is a rough estimate, but pretty accurate. So if we said 30,000 people at $50 a day times 365 days a year, that's $547 million spent just to buy the drugs in Metro Baltimore, not just the city, the surrounding area. This could apply to Erie, to Buffalo, to New York, to Chicago, to Los Angeles, to St. Louis, whatever. Uh, just plug in those numbers. That's just to buy the drugs. That doesn't count any of the other societal costs family disruption, health care. Um, when I see, uh, you know, reading the newspaper or when I worked for 20 years at a trauma center, someone comes in with a gunshot wound or a stabbing and they don't have insurance. Among the other things I think about later is, um, gee, that, that, that's $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 in uncompensated care. There's a technique sometimes that uh, drug dealers tell me about that they use to enforce um, their, their turf. Instead of shooting somebody in the head or the chest in order to kill them, they would aim at their navel, their belly button, and sever, sever the spinal cord. It sends a different message. In Ireland, there was a, uh, when the Protestant Catholics were really at physical war with each other, there was kneecapping, so you cripple somebody. You go to certain neighborhoods in, in uh, downtrodden areas in, in your community, and you'll, you may see a number of people in wheelchairs. More often than not, it's not an accident. It's a gunshot wound aimed at the spinal cord to sever the spinal cord so they would be crippled for life. And that costs us all a lot of money, not to mention the suffering that that person has to go through. So that's the math there. And um, Michael Smirkonish, who's been one of the speakers at uh, uh, Jefferson Educational uh, Society, um, published my article. And I tried to connect here the uh, opioid crisis with the surge at the southern border. I mean, historically, people flee when things are intolerable. Slavery, the pilgrims fleeing uh, uh, England and Europe because of uh, religious persecution. People climbing over the Berlin Wall. I remember just as a kid seeing people climbing over the Berlin Wall. What a risk. Things really had to be bad. Things have to be really bad in Guatemala and El Salvador to, for you to consider walking a thousand miles across the desert with your children and all the risks that take place. What's going on there is narco-terrorism. And the narco-terrorism exists because we are consuming drugs. But note that the data on in the CDC comment here, the CDC reported that opioids were responsible for 81,000 deaths, up over 38%, cocaine up 26%, methamphetamine from 35, by 35% in 2020. We didn't hear about that too much because uh, COVID took uh, the headlines for everything, but the opioid crisis did not go away, it got worse. And uh, I see that uh, every time uh, I uh, do something and, and look at uh, in the emergency room or otherwise. Now, uh, the CDC, very good at doing some things, uh, maybe not so good at doing others, but they just released this report here April 16th of 2021, uh, just a couple of months ago, and they analyzed the uh, cost of the opioid epidemic from four years ago, and you know it's not less, uh, over $1 trillion, $1 trillion. So there's 
lots and lots of money uh, going on here. And I remember hearing in Annapolis when I asked uh, a state's attorney, and it was a hearing on sentencing issues, but I asked them uh, for my county, Baltimore County, how much crime in our county is due to, is related to drugs in one way or another. And my county is a very nice suburban county, middle class, uh, certainly not anything you would drive by and look at and say there's a really uh, downtrodden, uh, impoverished area. He said 85% of crime is due to drug-related issues. And that probably holds true throughout the United States. So whenever you're reading these crime stories or see these things, and I've taken care of lots of crime victims and criminals as well, and overwhelmingly, it's drug-related. Yes, there's some crazy people who get guns. Yes, there's some domestic violence that takes place, but it, and those are terrible things. But there's nowhere near the number of people who um, uh, are involved in the drug trade and are fighting over one thing or another related to that. And it gets individual. These are two pictures from those uh, 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 vigil, drug vigils where somebody died, a family member. Um, I'm fortunate I've not been personally touched in that regard. Again, my perspective comes from just talking to the thousands of patients I've taken care of in the ER and another vigil of somebody who, who died. And so when I, we go through all these statistics, it's always important to remember that there's a actual human being who had a name, who had a family, who had friends uh, involved. These aren't just abstractions, they're all real people and when I take care of them. Now, I, I always remember that, that, that that's, that's a person I'm taking care of and regardless of what they've done. Um, now, I just wanna tell you one other story. I took care of a guy uh, he, he was at the homeless clinic and he had just spent 25 years in prison. He was about 58 years old and he went in when he was 27, something like that. And, uh, and uh, he, was, he needed to get a physical exam in order to go to the halfway house on his parole. Well, it was easy. To, the physical part was very easy. He spent a lot of time in the weight room. He was kind of big and intimidating. In fact, I kept him on one side of the room and me with the door ajar on the other side. But after just a few seconds of talking, I realized this was a really brilliant guy. And he, I said, you were in jail for 25 years for drug dealing. And he kind of shrugged on. In fact, I had a lot of patients who would say things like, I'd always ask him, have you ever been in jail? And they say, yeah, I did a two spot. They say two spot meaning two years, sort of the way you might say, oh, we went out to dinner last night, two spot. It's just sort of the thing that happens. But anyway, he'd been in for, for 20 plus years. And, and, and as he just told me a story, because I was not rushed in that situation, it turned out he was a major dealer uh, from uh, Washington, DC up to Southern Jersey. He had windowless uh, vans that delivered the uh, drugs. He had uh, uh, large rooms where huge shipments of drugs came in, sort of like that pictures of the things we saw with all the guns, where people with no clothes on would repackage these huge shipments of drugs into little bags that then could be distributed to the street corner. All the five, 10, 20, $50, greasy cash transactions came into another room where people were sitting with no clothes on again for obvious reasons to um, uh, package the money for the money laundering. And so we went through the whole rigmarole. I was talking about enforcement, the, the violence he'd ordered, the murders he'd ordered. He didn't actually commit any himself and he wasn't a drug user either particularly. But then I asked him, I said, uh, so what were you taking home? I mean, you're telling me about this business, what were you taking home personally? It's just you and me in the room. I, I don't have anybody to tell. And he looked at me and he said, $25,000 a week tax-free. $25,000 a week tax-free in $1990. And so um, I said, where's the money? He said, well, my family's comfortable. When I get out, uh, I'll, I'll be reasonably set up. And I said, well, was it worth it? Was it worth it? And he really shook his head and couldn't be sure, but he said it was the only way uh, that he could you know, make a, a really good living. He could have been a great businessman, a great entrepreneur, a great contributed to society because he was brilliant and smart that way, but there it was. Now, let me shift to the next uh, policy situation, which is the pain issue. And um, this is something most patients come to the emergency room because of pain. Uh, so uh, this is a quick rundown of the medications that are available for pain. Uh, we'll skip the non-pharmacologic. They're certainly useful, but there's the pharmacologic. Uh, I am a proponent of medical cannabis. I wish it had been more properly researched, but we barred that from happening. Uh, but basically, it's the first four, and then you get into the narcotics, and then there's some other medications which are trickier to prescribe. Um, there are a lot of serious issues about pain and pain management and uh, 
drug-seeking behaviors and using pain management specialists. Um, that's a topic for a whole other discussion, but Big Pharma got involved um, at one point, and I'm gonna tell you about that. And uh, there is something that you in that now in every state called the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. So we physicians, are mon every time we write a uh, uh, prescription drug that's in the schedule two to five, uh, that are, those are the controlled substances, uh, get, that gets recorded. By the way, everything else we prescribe does not, but actually that'd be really useful information to me have as a clinician to know what my patients are taking, but the, the drug dealers don't use the prescription drug monitoring program, but this was the pendulum that swung. So this new policy event came and uh, it was manifested in 1996 to 2002 and three that there was this pain crisis. People weren't being adequately treated for pain. And here's some examples of bills from Maryland, but let me assure you, this was going on in every state. Now I was a doctor before 1996 um, and there were nurses and we treated pain. We didn't let people writhe in pain, but suddenly it appeared to be that there was no, uh, everybody was writhing in pain and all us clinicians were hard hearted and didn't care. And so there was this whole series of bills and you can see what they, um, uh, have to say, uh, you know, inadequacy of traditional pain management and so on. And uh, the board may not subject a physician for prescribing controlled substance. Most of these bills did, did not pass. I think almost all of these I'm showing you uh, did not pass or maybe one did. Um, and I, I had to fight them. Uh, I could tell there was something really wrong with this because I knew from reality, the way it works in Maryland, like most states, legislative session was January to April, but April through January, I was working as an ER doctor, day shifts, night shifts, night shifts, weekends, and holidays like any other ER doc. And we took care of people with pain. And so this really struck me as odd. I, I, it was a challenge as a, the only physician in the legislature for most of that time to um, not appear to be that I didn't care about patients, but I knew there was something that just didn't smell right about this. And here's yet another bill, once again, and this drumbeat uh, pounded into all the clinicians' heads. And in fact, here's a sign up sheet from a hearing and you'll see this first name uh, and he's from the American Pain Foundation and then there was the Maryland Pain Initiative. This was typical again, I have the Maryland one because I was a Maryland legislator, but this was typical in every state in the United States. American Pain Foundation, we find out years later was a front by big pharma companies, especially Purdue Pharmaceutical um, to uh, get us all uh, riled up. And uh, the guy who spoke, I remember him, Charming, good looking, articulate, uh, very convincing. Maryland Pain Initiative, also another front organization. But people didn't know that at the time. I didn't know it at the time because that information was not available. But I just knew factually this wasn't really the issue that was made out to be. But then our board of physicians got involved, and so did other boards. We were told that um, we physicians didn't know anything about treating pain. And I mean the whole category of people in pain management and hospitals. That would include the pharmacists, the nurses, the physician's assistants, the nurse practitioners, the uh, uh, CRNAs, the certified nurse anesthetists, you know, as if we didn't care or didn't know. So our board of physicians, which is the licensing board that controls my life and my ability to be employed, set up this hotline number. That hotline number went to a Purdue, Purdue Pharmaceutical drug rep. Check this one out. Inadequate pain control because of physician reluctance to use medications such as morphine. The flip side of that is physicians use more morphine. Look at this message that we were all getting from our licensing board. And then they had a speaker series funded by, well, there it is right there in black and white, Purdue Pharmaceutical, Purdue Frederick Company, the company that you probably all know um, had ended up being fined hundreds of millions of dollars because of their terrible ways they pushed these drugs. I went to, had to go to these um, conferences because we all wore. And I remember um, one of the speakers saying, uh, well, the pain soaks up the OxyContin. The patients will never get addicted to OxyContin. And in my head, I was screaming, what a lie, what a lie. Now, it wasn't enough to do it just in the March of 1998, fall of 1998. Again, the same uh, message. And hey, look, another unrestricted grant from Purdue Pharmaceutical makes this all possible. So um, this is where nurses were kind of starting to ask people, do you have pain? And filling out little smiley faces and frowny faces. And if somebody had pain, we doctors would have called and have to do something about it. The pendulum swung way too far. 
Uh, I tried to resist this as much as I could. And now sometimes it swung too far the other way with people with real pain or not getting the medications they needed. There are a bunch of other issues that uh, are going to be uh, just glossed over right now. Each one is worthy of a whole discussion. Uh, the racial disparity issue uh, is really significant. Uh, it has hit the communities of color much harder. Uh, cannabis legalization now um, is uh, in, allowed in many states. Only 11 states do not allow medical or personal adult use. I don't use the term recreational. I think it sounds too frivolous, personal adult use. You should be responsible if you're going to do this. Um, if you're looking for any kind of consistency in the world of cannabis, because it's illegal at the federal level and states, a patchwork quilt, every state has a different approach to this, do not expect consistent. Portugal is really an important experiment that they did 10 years ago. Uh, they decided they would decriminalize drugs. And everybody said, every heroin addict in Europe is going to congregate in Lisbon and Porto and come to Portugal. Uh, and, but they also said, we're going to ramp up our public health. A, uh, treatment. We're going to get treatment on demand 24-7, 365. And they did. And it worked. Um, crime has gone way down. Addiction has gone way down. All the side categories of addiction, needles on the street, disease, AIDS, hepatitis, uh, alphabet of dis hepatitis, disease, all are down. And many more people are in treatment and are functioning. Think of it as a chronic disease and they got people into long-term treatment and uh, different kinds of treatment work for different people. So not all one size fits all, just like treating high blood pressure is gonna be different for different people. We've cut health at the cut uh, social program. So anyway, Portugal work, we all look at that model. At the same time, we've uh, developed this prison industrial complex, for-profit businesses that uh, run prisons and they're pretty awful places anyways. They're especially more awful now. Electronic monitoring industry has burdened militarization of police where they're using tanks and other stuff. And this is a really significant last bullet point there. The police financial depends, dependence on drug bust and acquisition of uh, uh, houses and cars and so forth. So the, really the who pays for this we all do, we're all paying for it, whether we think we're immediately connected or not. It's in our tax dollars, it's in our communities, it's everywhere, we're all paying for it and in our taxes. And so the key question is, why are so many Americans using drugs daily? I mean, what is going on? Now, this next part is my personal opinion. It's our focus on material wealth and other things that really don't have deeper human values. Um, and so when we start thinking about that, and I think, uh, Kathy Park Hong, in a way, put it put it another way, uh, as, as did Johan Hari, um, we really need to look in the mirror. Why are so many of us at such a level of despair and not finding other ways out uh, to deal with it other than drugs and alcohol? There's an interesting study. The iconic study was the rat study. We were told that a rat is put in a cage. There's two levers. One is drugs, one is food. And what are we told about that study? Uh, that the rat in the cage pushes the drug lever till it overdoses or doesn't push the food lever till it starves to death. I just wanna show you the source material. Someone else repeated that study numerous times, Bruce Alexander. He created Rat Park, basically a big space where everything that rats could want is there. Other rats, uh, cheese, tunnels, toys, whatever rats want. Also the levers were there for drugs. Very few rats use the drugs. And so the opposite of addiction is not just sobriety, it's connection and community. But what do we do with substance abusers? We put them in small cages by themselves, and then we wonder, uh, why aren't they getting better? So what we've been on is this uh, trajectory that is just getting worse and worse. And uh, all the numbers are, that you want to see get better are going in the wrong direction. And uh, it's just a, it's a disaster. And that's why I call this an epic a policy failure. One other thing about getting somebody into treatment immediately, and I'll go into the new policies now that I think we need to, to do. First, we got to acknowledge that what we're doing isn't working. Um, we got to stop making this a criminal issue. Now, certainly if people are committing violent crimes, yeah, you know, that, that's one thing. But just simple possession of drugs ought not to be criminalizing. Um, personalizing treatment is really important. Focus on harm reduction. Um, we're not gonna turn everybody into treatment into a sober tax paying citizen overnight and there will be relapses, that's understandable. 
But if think it's today is Tuesday. If you got somebody who is trying to get that fifty dollars a day every day, and we got them into treatment right now, at least tomorrow they're not doing some harmful behavior to themselves or someone else in order to get that fifty dollars. And we got to take the money out of this. Um, and so investment in treatment is not only less expensive, but it has that immediate return on investment. And we have to do something uh, to help uh, Central and South America. Canada. Um, has done safe consumption spaces. We do not have them in the United States yet. That's a place where addicts can go, person with substance abuse disorders can go and, and uh, shoot, their, shoot up there. Um, but there's always a rescuer. The number of overdose deaths and safe consumption spaces in Canada is zero. More importantly, they start getting that connection and they have a much higher rate. They usually are, they're always linked to a treatment center. And so they get people uh, there, they get connected with them instead of people shooting up in public bathrooms or under bridges or all alone uh, someplace and dying with a needle in their arm. Uh, they get saved, they get connected with folks and more and more of them get into treatment. And so there are lessons we can learn from Portugal and Canada. Last uh, few minutes here, um, as a state legislator, I just wanna say a few words because if you buy all of this, I want you to get involved in changing the trajectory of this issue um, by bringing this up to your state legislators. And so, um, a couple of the do's and don'ts is just keep sending material to folks over time. It's hard to sometimes grasp all these ideas at once. I want to ask you this question. And how many of you, if we were in a live audience, I'd say, tell me the name of your state legislator, state senator. Uh, I don't know how many of you can do that, um, but uh, you have to know yours. Look at this distinction in New Hampshire. They got 400 representatives in their house, almost the same as US Congress, whereas in California, it's a completely uh, different size scale. But you have to know who these people are. They're the ones that are doing the state laws, they're doing the voting rights laws, they're doing the LGBTQ laws, they're doing the education policy, environment, procurement, all kinds of issues uh, are at the state level. Um, but here's the thing, it doesn't take a lot to influence state legislators. I know because I was one for 24 years, I won six elections. so. Um, most state districts, most districts in the United States are carved up in such a way that if you win the primary election, uh, you're going to win the general election. Uh, and so Republican districts in Maryland, if uh, you're the Republican candidate, you've won the primary, you can go on a round the world cruise with your friend who's from a Democratic district uh, who's going to win the primary and undoubtedly win the Democratic election. In our state, to give you an example, but this is true around the United States, there's 47 districts, probably only 10 have contested general elections. And so uh, primary elections, look up some primary election results. They're one with just a few thousand votes. So just your vote there makes a huge difference. And let me assure you that every legislator knows who's voting in their district and are they in their party? Are they gonna help them in the primary election? Participate, a little bit of participation uh, goes a long way and communicate. Um, it's, I'll tell you, it's uh, not a, I'm not a, I'm a reasonably smart guy, uh, but I couldn't keep up with every issue all the time. And I learned that there were folks that I could rely on who'd help me understand fishing in the Chesapeake Bay, who helped me understand real estate tax law, who helped me understand all kinds of stuff. So um, just repeat polite messaging is the nice way uh, to communicate, but um, pay attention to these little items. They'll go a long way as you influence. Uh, back in 1998, I had the first major bill on addiction treatment. It was enacted. Uh, how do I know that? Because I kept asking my patients what brought them to the hospital. And I was the first state legislator in the United States to introduce these initiatives. And fortunately, now hospitals are pretty much having peer review, uh, peer, not peer review, uh, peer advisors uh, in hospital emergency rooms so that if somebody comes in with a laceration and, and their addiction is issue, I can ask the uh, other person to uh, go talk to them and see if we can get them into treatment. But uh, these did not pass, unfortunately, uh, the bottom three, but I think they should and maybe someday they will. I think these are the kinds of policies that will start to chip away and turn this around in another uh, direction. So these are the resources that uh, I think these are all great resources. Um, Johan Hari covers the uh, war on drugs. Michelle Alexander's book is outstanding. It's really a lot of policy, uh, but it's great stuff. Brittany Barnett's is much more the human side. She tells a lot of stories. So I hope you will um, get involved in this issue 
And uh, there's my contact information, my book. Uh, I hope uh, Ben and Olivia invite me back to talk about end of life care, but I'm available now for questions, comments, or personal attacks. So ben? Dr. Moore, Dr. Morheim, I'll be the first to thank you and say, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, let's get you back to learn more from you, learn about uh, other subjects you're studying. But on this one, by gosh, we've got a lot of great audience questions pouring in already. I'm going to remind folks, uh, if you're watching on Facebook, we're taking your questions in the comment section. Uh, just leave your comment uh, question there. We're going to get to as many as we can. If you're watching in the Zoom webinar, uh, use the Q&A function there. We're going to try to get to as many. I came in prepared with some, but Dr. Morheim, I'm going to go straight to some audience questions because these are great ones. You were just speaking of policy, and I think this one speaks right to that because that person's asking on a local level, again, you know, that guidance of how they can maybe impact some change. This person's asking, they say, as a member of a local decarceration group that was able to decriminalize marijuana in Erie a couple of years ago, what top three things can we do locally to unwind policy and practices that are the war on drugs? So on a local level, groups that are combating this, working at it, what do you recommend to them? What can they do today? Uh, first, continue, congratulations on getting that done and just continue to persist on that effort. I you know, throw a lot of stuff there on all those slides and I never quite know what's gonna stick. And so when you're talking to legislators or you're talking to policymakers, you try different kinds of things. And sometimes it's not even what you said, it's that maybe they have an experience, they have a nephew who has a, a drug uh, problem and that's what flips them over even though you've been talking and be persistent. Um, it, you know, I think of issues uh, that uh, took me a while to grasp were really important to other people. One of them had to do with fishing in the Chesapeake Bay. I won't even go into it, but there was huge war, groups at war about this and I didn't know anything about it. And they're looking at me like, this guy has a vote on this issue. He doesn't know anything about the issue, which was true. And so it took a while for me to grasp uh, what was going on and what my position is. I think always take a half a loaf if you can. That is, if you can make a small change, uh, that's important. And the other thing is um, the people who are coming out of prison really need a helping hand. And they are so stigmatized and all the doors are closed. And I, I talked to a lot of folks who they did their time. They, they did stupid things. They acknowledged it when they were young. And now they're 30, 40 years old and they can't get going. And so I think that's a really important effort. And, and Dr. Morham, right to that, another audience question is asking, how do we make amends or, or reparations to those individuals impacted, targeted and hurt? by policies created to serve the war on drugs. Uh, they say, for example, those serving life sentences for drug offenses, uh, can those sentences be reconsidered? How, how do we work to address that? Those impacted by it, those who have served time, or as we're working to now update uh, our, our uh, punishment to these crimes, how do we deal with folks whose life's ha lives have been irrevocably changed before this? Unfortunately, I don't think there's really good ways you can make up for somebody who spent 20 years in prison for something that's no longer a crime. But in some states, as they have uh, changed their cannabis laws at any rate, they have uh, added into those uh, taking out uh, the, the giving people pardons or letting them expunge their records, things like that, that make it a little bit easier. But you can't take away the time and suffering that people have had, um, even if you gave them money. So uh, I think what we have also, it, it, it's hard to go back and undo a lot of that, but, we, but we're compounding it now. So we have to still um, continue to change the laws because right now, today, people are being incarcerated and imprisoned and they're starting into that cycle. By the way, somebody did ask me on my personal message line, are these slides available? Yes, I'll give them to uh, Ben has them and he's welcome to share them or you can contact me and I'll be happy to share them. Wonderful. We, we really appreciate that, Dr. Morheim. And, and I'm going to go right to another audience question still on the war on drugs. Uh, you mentioned Portugal and that, that experiment is proven to work. This person is asking, is, is, the, is adopting something like that similar to Portugal uh, more effective or could, and I think we think of this in terms of how we deal with alcohol here in the States, would legalizing drugs and regulating them uh, like we do alcohol be more effective? Uh, which which would you recommend? Is it a both? How do we go at that? This person's curious of looking at how we might either head the Portugal route or something different. Uh, so let's just talk about alcohol briefly. And you know, there was two constitutional amendments, one to ban alcohol and then to uh, re-allow re alcohol. And uh, I think everybody knows it's not easy to pass a constitutional amendment. So it shows you the, the political mood swing. And so uh, legalizing alcohol after it was illegal, during the time that it was illegal, crime, toxic deaths, all kinds of disasters were occurring. Now, making it legal did not solve alcoholism or drunk driving. 
but at least there's a regulatory component that we can get to. And so I do favor, and you know, it's, it's not it's not that you want to say decrim. Certainly, I think we should decriminalize it. We just got to acknowledge that. Legalize is a word that's interesting because you don't want to have the suggestion that hey, you just go into a store, roll up your sleeve, and somebody's going to shoot some heroin into you. Um, that's not really what we're after here. But the Portugal experiment, getting you know a full, robust public health uh, approach is good. And, and and as an ER doctor, listen, many people, everybody with substance abuse disorder ends up in an ER sooner or later. I mean, that's just the nature of the way that works. And so there were so many times I just wish I, and they were in that moment too, that pregnant moment where they could have gone, gone to treatment if treatment was available. You know, uh, like I said, I could, I could have got an orthopedist for their broken bone, but I couldn't get a counselor in there to get them into the kind of treatment program. And some people, you know, would do best with long-term care, other people methadone, other people faith-based. I have no treatment dogma. It's an individual thing. But, you know, we, we got to realize how much this, this policy has has been perverse and damaging to every aspect of our society. And so chip away at it, please, any way that you can. And so a couple of different times, shifting topics here, but a couple of different times in your presentation, mental health came up. Yeah. And this person's uh, looking at that through the lens of COVID-19 and the impacts that we've seen to uh, behavioral health numbers now. And looking at that post-COVID, moving forward, this person's asking any suggestions. How do you feel about those numbers? Any suggestions? Because we're looking at now dealing with behavioral health numbers on the rise because of a global catastrophic pandemic, a public health crisis like none other we've seen in a century. Well, for my whole medical career, I've been fighting for what's called parity, that we treat mental health issues the same as we treat physical health issues, or at least better. And, and there's certainly uh, that, that it just has not happened for a host of reasons. And I think it gets much more to the deeper structure of how our healthcare or sick care system operates. But yes, there's a huge, if the Venn diagram of substance abuse and mental health overlaps uh, tremendously. Um, there's that term dual diagnosis, but I remember, you know, as a practical matter in the ER trying to yeah, get somebody in, into uh, one or the other and the mental health people say, we can't take them because of our criteria is using drugs. And the drug people, would, you know, the substance abuse area would say, well, we can't take care of them either because he's got a mental health problem or she's got a mental health problem. And it was like ping pong, you know, tennis match, like banging back and forth. And I got the person in front of me trying to figure out how do I get them to the care that they need? So we have a long way to go. And yes, COVID, of course, has made that all worse because of the isolation, because of the um, people being packed together and not getting out and all that other stuff. And that's why we see that, you know, it's interesting, as I pointed out, that the, the the drug numbers, but also the suicide numbers have, have gone up. And that's just been not in the headlines, unfortunately. I mean, it's not like I like to see those kinds of things in headlines, but it's fallen off the, the media radar screen and it ought to get back on. And, and we in the public ought to demand that that be looked at. Well, and I think that's the, the work you're doing in uh, the, the Q&A section proves that a lot of thanks from viewers coming in uh, saying thank you, thank you, thank you for this and, and shining a light on it. That's one of the things we have to shine a light on. And I think this is a great way to do that by having these tough conversations around this and looking at this earlier in your presentation, you also mentioned the role of big pharma and this person has that on their mind saying, do you think the court case against Purdue, uh, where they pled guilty, will help in any way uh, fizzle out the opioid crisis in the near future? Will this have an impact on them? Well, I don't think you can punish the people in Purdue Pharmaceuticals enough. And I think actually the principals of the company got off scot-free and aren't doing any time or being personally hurt uh, at all. And I think they're, they're, you know, it's really criminal behavior that they engaged in. But, they, but you know, this whole complicity that went on with, with uh, legislation, well-meaning legislators, by the way, all those legislators were good people. They were just approached uh, by and, and caring people. And they were approached and saying, there's this problem. I was the one because I was in, in the field. They said, this isn't really a problem. Um, so the, the, the way that, that, uh, hopefully this will send a message, but we have to kind of hit the, um, you know, the pendulum swing too far one way and then it swings too far the other way. There are people who are dying of cancer or aren't able to get adequate treatment because the physician's afraid of prescribing too many narcotics. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's got to find the uh, sweet spot in the middle on this, but uh, big pharma certainly had a role, not all of big pharma. I don't want to say all drug companies, but few. Purdue being the main, but there were a couple of others who really um, did a, you know, an outstanding job from a bad point of view of getting their products sold. And we need to be wary of what's going on now for all the other things that are going on. Well, I, 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 basically, I would say let clinicians do their job. 
Well, I've worked with a lot of clinicians over the years and they're all caring. I've also, I've also worked with a lot of law enforcement, two in the emergency room at a trauma center, there's police there. They're also caring people who are, who are working very hard, the fire department, the EMS uh, groups, all those folks are doing a really good job, but there's a corrupting element that takes place, uh, especially in the, in the law enforcement side because of the money involved and the fact that a lot of small police departments are sustained financially by the drug bust and we've got a for-profit prison industrial complex that needs to be completely overhauled. A lot of different things that we could take a whole other conversation, a whole other yeah. program to unpack. Well, I'm going to sneak in as try, many try. audience. That's good. I just really wanted to give people a framework, though, that these are it, not these things are not etched in stone. These are policies that we made, decisions consciously people made, and we can change. And I think that's one of the things, the great things you keep coming back to. And I think that, again, from your unique perspective, as somebody who served at, on, on the legislature, who was also a physician and has seen this from the front lines, you understand that. And at one point, you even said you might have been the only, I, I can't think of many physicians who have gone on to be elected officials in the capacity you were. And, and so just real briefly, walk us through the idea of why run, why get involved, and then why try to be the lonely voice in the room. You know, I got involved because so much of what I see in the emergency room was social issues of all kinds, uh, not just drugs, but uh, uh, high, you know, untreated hypertension, uh, uh, obesity, tobacco, you know, and I, I remember very distinctly kind of, in a, I, I never set out in my life to be a politician. That wasn't like in, on my to-do list, um, but I started getting involved in some of these issues. And I remember very clearly sewing a guy's uh, laceration that went uh, down his entire side of his scalp and face because he'd been hit by a beer bottle. This was like at two in the morning. And of course, you know, picking out the glass and doing the repair. And I'm figuring, uh, uh, talking to him, say, how did this get started? Well, the evening began uh, pleasantly enough, but then somebody, they got a little drunk and somebody made a crack and cracked him upside the head with the beer bottle. And there I was at two in the morning. And I thought so much of what I'm seeing is um, uh, has an antecedent. The ER is the flip side of prevention medicine. And so I thought if I'm gonna spend these, you know, two in the morning in a big emergency room doing this, why don't I try and tackle that out onto the, into the community. I got involved in some local politics and next thing I knew I was running for office and my constituents were kind enough to elect me six times. So, and then my wife said that was enough and I kind of had enough after 24 years, but it was really just came right out of my clinical experience and seeing all these things that could have and should have been treated elsewhere. And clearly people are grateful for that and for this presentation. I'm just going to read one of the comments real quickly. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, let's keep shining a light on this unbelievable situation and find a way to help effectively. You're doing that. We appreciate that. The audience does as well. Another audience question that I do want to turn to, because we talked about cannabis use before, and, and I know you acknowledge the, the, the difficulty of navigating from state to state, but then state to federal. This person is acknowledging many employers still do routine drug tests. Uh, some employees use prescription medical care cannabis, they can be terminated on a drug test. So how do we start navigating this? Because so this I'll, is get, I'll give it from an ER, ER point of view, which is um, uh, what I would say is, is it's the degree of impairment that's taking place. So um, the, na the, the way drug testing works, if you've got a high blood alcohol or you're testing positive for cocaine or heroin, you're probably intoxicated at that point. But cannabis, because of the way the metabolism works, the urine test, you could be high on cannabis for whatever reason. And a lot of cannabis, cannabis users, let's, let's drive slowly and don't go driving, they'd rather stay home. Uh, but you'll still test positive several days later. It's the degree of impairment. And so there are impairment tests. But after alcoholism, the number two cause of impairment is not drugs, it's actually fatigue. I've taken care of thousands of people in car accidents from minor fender benders to major multi-car crashes. And they're driving home after a night shift. I remember a few nights just I was driving home a little bit tired. Um, they're, uh, you know, working 12 hour shifts, taking a nap and then trying to go back to work. But I don't have a fatigue meter. There's no blood test. I can't put a probe in and see how tired you are. So there's other dynamics. And so the degree of impairment. I see one other question I just want to um, emphasize a little bit. This is not just an urban problem. It's spectacularly a rural problem. And, you know, this is an area where, you know, hopefully the pol great political divide we're seeing can come together if people will just get themselves unlocked from their mindset of uh, view viewing this as like it's all prison or it's all, you know, legalize everything. I think we can chip away at both sides of that to the middle. And, but, you know, from my point of view, I would do anything that works. Clearly what we've been doing is not working. Otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation.
And, and uh, I'm glad you pointed that out because I was going to sneak that one in. I'm going to sneak one more in and I'm, I'm going to ask got, you this. I can go because past five if you need to. You I, That's I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate <laughs> it because I want to get to this one because you took us from uh, Nixon uh, to Reagan through Clinton. And this person says, you know, Dr. Morheim, is the Biden administration uh, including your suggestion in its policies? In other words, should we expect this administ- administration to be doing the right things? Because clearly they think you're getting it right. Uh, is the Biden administration listening? What does the Biden administration policy playbook look like right now? Uh, what can we expect in the next uh, next three years? Well, um, just to be political, I'm a Democrat and I was all for Biden. So um, I don't think they moved as far enough on this issue as I would like to see them move. I know there's some, I, I, you know, my reports here really from what I read in the newspaper and the media. Um, And so, uh, yeah, I'd like to see the Biden administration move much more aggressively on this. And I think it can be packaged in a way that appeals to uh, those in red states who are seeing um, uh, meth and cocaine problems and uh, opioid deaths at an alarming rate, West Virginia being a prime example. So maybe you can reach out to Joe Manchin on that one and pull them in for other things. Uh, So, uh, yeah, they have obviously got a a plate full of things to deal with. And uh, so state legislators who are doing those voting right laws or voting unright laws, I guess, uh, if I can say. Um, So focus on your state legislators. They can do quite a bit of stuff. And it's much more of a retail operation where you can actually have influence. I mean, I had a staff of one and then a Hopkins grad student. Um, We don't have, you know, huge armies of people. And 45 states, it's, it's a citizen legislature. They're not full time. And so you can get pretty much access to them. And and this is where a lot of those conversations, also a lot of those state legislators go on to be federal legislators. So don't just aim up high, go to the the level that, you know, your city council person, because they may well be eight or 10 years from now, the next governor, and you've had a relationship with them around this issue. And they're going to be more likely to listen to you, especially if you've helped them get elected a little bit, which isn't a bad way, if you like them. And, and, and we've seen that happen in Erie. And, and I would say, you know, in Pennsylvania, because earlier you mentioned New Hampshire being the largest, Pennsylvania is second only to New Hampshire. And we're the largest full-time state legislatures out there. So we have plenty of representatives to go talk to in our area. A lot of thanks in the comment section. Fabulous presentation. Thank you. Excellent By the way, Pennsylvania is the most highest paid state legislators too. And, and, and I hope you're getting, your, you're getting your money's worth. We, we need to be getting our money's <laughs> worth. So uh, I, I just want to thank you again, Dr. Thank Moran, you. for all of this. This has been a fantastic conversation, clearly one that can go on and on and a lot to pick through and take a look at. I'm so grateful that you're going to make the slides available. Also, folks that are still on and want to watch this again to pick up the tidbits along the way, this will be available on our website. So just once again, I, I, I want to say, uh, Dr. Dan Morheim, a physician, state legislature, academic, author, consultant, Thank you. Thank you. Thank and, you for sharing your insights and knowledge with and, us. And you have my email. There's just my name, Dan Morheim at Gmail. So I'll send you the slides directly. Or if you um, want to have me speak someplace else, I'm happy to do that. Thank you so much, Ben and Jefferson. Absolutely. And folks, thank you for those watching along via Zoom webinar, for those watching on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Without you, uh, these programs and the exchange of information and ideas would not be possible. For more information about uh, Dr. Uh, Morheim's work, I do uh, invite you to head over to thebetterend.com. And for more information about upcoming JES digital programming, uh, head over to our website, jeserie.org. There you're also going to find videos of other past presentations available to stream on demand and other publications, including reports, essays, and timely writings, as well as information about other upcoming JES initiatives. And of course, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.